Good morning, everyone. We invite children ages 5 to 12 to head to class in the back, and everyone else may stand up and connect with your church family. Say hello. I want to remind you all to check your bulletins. If you didn't get a physical bulletin, look online. If you can't get, if you need help finding our online access to our bulletin, connect with me after church, and we'll help you get with that. Our opening psalm this morning, I mean our opening scripture, is Psalm chapter 36, verses 5 through 11. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. May the foot of the proud not come against me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. I invite you this morning to stand and lift your voice to God with us. Well, today marks the beginning of Holy Week, Palm Sunday. So we are hopeful that you spent the season of Lent connecting with God and growing with Him. There's a couple of things we want to point out real quick in the bulletin that you want to take with you. We have something in here about baptism season coming up. We have something in here about communion coming up next Sunday. We also want to point out that this Wednesday is our hot meal service, the Transform Community Serves, and then this coming Friday at 5 o'clock is our Good Friday service. So we hope that you will be able to make it to that. Inside of your bulletin, you will also notice a palm cross. This, these palm crosses, the proceeds of the purchase, goes to supporting an orphanage. And they are here today representing Palm Sunday, the palms that we are going to read about today in our scripture. So we hope that you will be able to take them with you today as a reminder of what today is, what today is the beginning of, and that you will be filled with the joy of the Lord in your life and in your home. We invite you to join us in prayer this time. Thank you, God, for sustaining our lives today, for bringing us together, for continuing to allow us to observe this church tradition of recognizing the fulfillment of prophecy that happens on this day we call Palm Sunday. We pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and connect us closer to you this week as we observe Holy Week, as we come together Wednesday for a meal, as we come together on Friday to remember and reflect on the sacrifice that you make for us, Jesus, that you made for us. And then we return next Sunday to celebrate your resurrection and our salvation purchased for us. We ask you to be in this place today. Give us physical healing. Give us mental peace. Give us clarity in your words that are spoken and protect us from the efforts of the evil one. In your holy name we pray, Lord Jesus, all God's people said, Amen. So, now we should be looking at Psalm 36, verse 5. I think I should be next. Yes. So this first verse from our opening psalm reads, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the sky. So we want to point out that the literary style of the Psalms is poetry. A lot of the stuff that's in Psalms is not meant to be understood literally because it is written in a poetic form. There's a lot in there that we can understand literally. That's where careful reading comes into play. But we see the artistry from David on display in this Psalm as he uses this very artistic language and phrasing to describe God. The language used in this first verse describes God's love and faithfulness as beyond our understanding. When it talks about reaching to the heavens and to the skies, it's describing it as being beyond our understanding, bigger than us. It describes that it's far beyond us, and that's how we can see this poetic and artistic writing on display to convey this truth about God. Next, in verse 6, it continues. Your righteousness, God's righteousness, is like the highest mountains. Your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. 
The great deep refers to the depths of the ocean, more powerful than mankind. If a human goes deep enough into water, the pressure will crush you and kill you. The highest mountains are massive, they're strong, they represent sturdiness and unshakableness. Next, in verse 7, how priceless is your unfailing love, O God. See, this is something we can understand better, really. Even though it is still a form of poetry to praise God, we can understand this literally. They feast on the abundance of your house. Okay, there's not a literal house that people are eating. This is not a house made out of candy like from Hansel and Gretel. This is obviously metaphorical. We see that switch. You give them drink from your river of delights. Again, with the metaphors, we switch in between from David, literal and metaphorical, all to communicate truths to us. He describes God's love as unfailing, and his presence is compared to the wings of birds who shelter the young with them, warm, strong, and safe. Just like a hen would lay on its eggs when it is trying to, I think it's brooding, is the word for it, trying to develop them to where they can hatch. Next, in verse 9, For with you is the fountain of life. Well, we know that the water of life, the living water we receive from God, is Jesus. In your light we see light. We know that God is light. That he is the opposite of the darkness, which is representative of evil, representative of the devil. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. May the foot of the proud not come against me nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. So it's great how this psalm, not this psalm, but all the psalms, often contain a two-part praise and prayer composition. So it's a composition that can be very useful for us as we read it, to be able to understand it. So if we study the psalms and look to apply that pattern to our prayer lives, then we can understand there's elements of praising God for who He is or His qualities as well as asking him for his blessings in our lives, for these specific things. We see David here acknowledging God as the fountain of life, that he is the living water source that we often read about in Scripture, that he's the source of light, and we can see light because he gives it to us. But then it closes with appealing to God for his protection, with a specific ask to keep wickedness away to drive it away from me. Don't let me be pulled away by the efforts of evil. Our next passage of scripture is Isaiah 42. Next, beginning with verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching the islands will put their hope. This prophecy is about Jesus. This prophecy tells us things about him. It tells us that he will live in faithfulness. Jesus lived in faithfulness. It tells us that his purpose will be his ultimate and only goal. That will be his only focus, to bring justice to the world. And then we know from his life recorded in the New Testament that that is what he did. We know that his strength committed, his strength and commitment to remain a pure, sinless sacrifice for mankind is a truly amazing act of love and service. All these things talked about more than 400 years before his birth, telling us what he would be. Most of us can't deny ourselves for one day, let alone a 30-plus year lifetime. But that's what Jesus did. Most of us grow discouraged at times, struggling to remain strong with faith in what we can't see directly. And there are moments where we read at the very end where Jesus' humanity comes out. So that when we read about how we have a Savior who understands us, a priest who understands us and gets it, we know that he struggled, too, with his emotions. He struggled with the weight of his mission. It doesn't mean that he didn't stay committed to it. It just means that he felt the things that we feel. 
God blesses some of us with the ability to see Him through creation. But that isn't the same thing as seeing His form. We experience the evidence of God's existence the same way that we experience the evidence of the wind's existence. Does anybody here doubt that the wind exists? No. Why? Because we can feel the wind. We can see it move. Does everybody here believe love exists? There are some people in this world who don't. They believe love does not exist because it's not something you can feel or touch. But do we or do we not feel love? We feel love. We have felt different kinds of love throughout our lives. And we will feel different kinds of love throughout our lives. So we know that it is there because we can feel it. Does that mean everything we feel is real and true? No. But we can see the way that the wind moves. It's invisible, but we can see it. Doesn't that sound like a paradox? How can you see something invisible? How can you feel something that you can't touch? Sometimes you can even hear the wind. If it picks up certain debris, then you can taste the wind when it blows. Maybe you've traveled to different areas and you've had wind blowing and you're like, this wind tastes weird. <laughs> I'm sure you just say it like that. I'm hoping you're connecting with what I'm saying. I mean, I notice that when I drive from one area to another, especially going through Indiana, I don't remember what highway it is, but it smells bad in my car when I drive through Indiana. And I, I don't open my window because I know that if I open my window, it smells so bad that I'm going to taste it too. But as funny and crazy as that might sound, right? We know that water tastes differently based on where it comes from because wherever it comes from affects what's in the water. And it's very subtle. A lot of people can't taste the difference between water and they think it's just bland. I can taste the difference between water. And there's a lot of people who can, but the reason why that is is because there's stuff in it that we can't see that's affecting that taste. I mean, if you're ever driving down the road with your windows open in the summertime, and you see a bunch of nasty dust being kicked up, maybe street sweepers going by, do you or do you not roll up your window? You probably roll up your window, right? Why? Allergies. So allergies. Okay, but let's say that you're singing real loud to a song that you really like, and that dust is going to come into your window while your window is open and you're driving down the street. What's going to happen? <laughs> go in your mouth, right? And you're going to probably get dirt or whatever nastiness that is on your mouth. Has anybody tasted dirt before? Um, now that <laughs> it's okay if you've tasted dirt before. Nobody thinks that y'all are eating dirt outside before you come into church. We all reasonably understand it was probably when you were a child. So if you've tasted dirt before and you know dirt has a taste, then dirt or dust is dust is dirt picked up in the wind, goes into your mouth, you're tasting the wind. <laughs> you know what? We need some fun. We need to think about some funny things. But it illustrates a great point for us. If something is invisible, it doesn't mean it's not there. Just because we can't touch it in the traditional sense, like I can touch this pen, it doesn't mean it's not there. So the first four verses talks about Jesus 400 years before his birth. And we know this truth. Why? Because Matthew 12, 16 through 21 quotes this, cites this truth, and it adds verse 5 from this chapter into it. Jesus describes himself in four places as a servant. The scripture opened, my servant, here's my servant. He describes himself as a servant twice in Matthew and twice in Mark. He is also established throughout scripture as the servant, not a servant. So that's how, it's, that's how we start to see and understand his deity. That he is not just a God or a servant or a sacrifice. He is the. The islands in this scripture, in this prophecy, who put their hope in his teaching, refers to every person who responds to God's, recall, God's call to return. Because we are islands due to our separated we are islands because we are separated from God due to our sinful state. Just like an island is separated from the rest of the land. 
We can also understand that we are islands because of our perceptions, because of our attitudes and our decision making. We were just talking this morning before we started about how it's hard for some people to think beyond yourself. Some people don't seem to be capable of thinking bigger. Some people do have that capability and we start to think bigger, but then life hits us as soon as we leave. Life hits us later on. We'll start to be this close to grasping that new understanding until life hits us. And it's interesting how we can be so close to growth, but then that barrier pops up in front of us and keeps us from making that next step, reaching that next level. That is because who doesn't want you to reach it? Satan. He doesn't want you reaching that next level of understanding with God. He doesn't want you reaching that next level of strength and confidence with Him. Next, verse 5. This is what God the Lord says. The creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. The prophet Isaiah continues to record the words spoken by God about the coming Messiah. These verses speak to us about Jesus and how his being relates to us. God speaks of Jesus here, that he will make him a covenant for mankind and a light for non-Jews called Gentiles in Scripture. He says that the light of Jesus will open the eyes of the blind and set us free. The prison God speaks of here is not a physical prison, but the prison of sin. You may not realize that your sin is a prison. And maybe not every person, excuse me, maybe not every sin is a prison for every person. But you will find out if you haven't yet that there is at least one sin that you will encounter in life that is like a prison. Where you'll try to escape it repeatedly, but they catch you every time. That, that specific sin that feels like Alcatraz. Like it's surrounded by water, and there's sharks in the water, and then there's mines in the water, and then there's electricity in the water. And you keep trying to escape, but something keeps catching you up every time you get this close to freedom. There is something that will affect you. It may not be one of those obvious things we've talked about before, though. Because the mighty chain, the mighty prison, the Alcatraz in most of our lives, well, not most of our lives, in some of our lives, is pride. The reason why that is such a stronghold of sin, such a strong prison keeping us enslaved, in, in is because pride's chains are also extremely deceptive, as many forms of evil are. The reason why is because pride manifests in us in so many ways. We don't often see an obvious marker of pride. It's not like when you can obviously identify something as murder or theft or lust because they have obvious things. Pride is a lot sneakier most of the time and we can see the effects of it though. They're like the microscopic germs and bacteria that cause illness or make that water taste a little funky when it comes out of your faucet. We can't see them unless it turns brown or purple, but we can see their symptoms. So a common way for pride to manifest is an attitude of superiority. It sneaks up on us like a cat sneaks up on a bird. We don't even realize that we have the attitude sometimes. But it manifests in our tone and our behavior towards those who we've subconsciously deemed inferior. we subconsciously developed a sense of superiority that we're better than somebody else. And then it comes out in how we speak to them or how we treat them. And sometimes we don't know. But that's why pride is so sneaky. Because it's one of those things, it's one of those ways that it attacks that requires you to be studying and trying to be conscious of yourself, your struggles, and the things around you. This can also manifest in an attitude of entitlement. 
something that can cause us to be separated from God, feeling entitled to something that we aren't really entitled to. It's the feeling that we deserve something while another person doesn't. Entitlement can motivate selfish actions and choices, like pushing others or manipulating them to get your way. Entitlement often seeks to take for oneself, which means depriving someone else, because not everybody can have everything. In order for you to receive something, it must come from somebody else. So if you are more deserving of something than somebody else, even if you aren't saying it that way, you're wanting to take for yourself something that belongs to someone else. Entitlement is one of the things that creates resentment between you and others. It's one of the things that causes division in the church because you feel entitled to something in the church. You feel entitled to a specific seat or you feel entitled to a certain area of the church or a certain position in the church. It creates resentment. Maybe not on your part towards others, but others towards you because you try to force that sense of entitlement into reality. The resentment that comes from your part, from the sense of entitlement, is that you're envious and jealous of what somebody else has because you think you deserve it, which causes you to be sneaky behind their backs, causes you to find ways to manipulate the situation so that you can take from somebody else what is coming to them to claim it for yourself. I've heard some excuse, I've heard some people excuse entitlement based on what may sound like logic in human terms, but we cannot justify a sense of entitlement when we accept the truth of God's word. God makes it clear that all things come from him as the creator. So he makes it clear that all things belong to him by right as the creator. The first example of that may be in the first few chapters of Genesis. And I know we talk about Genesis a lot. The first 11 chapters in particular explain so much and create a strong foundation for us that it's important we keep talking about it. God demonstrates his ownership of creation by placing one of his creations, mankind, in a position of authority over all the rest of creation, except for one tree. I bet the church knows that one tree, right? What is the one tree that God said that mankind does not have control over or is not entitled to? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Yes. I knew the church would know because we talk about it so much. He basically said, this tree is mine and it's not for you, so don't touch it. It's like he had his kids over to his house and he said, here's a box of snacks for you. You can eat all of this, but this stuff is mine, you don't touch it. And then they go and eat your good food, and they leave the snacks you left out for them in that box. It's a lot more serious than that, but that's a good illustration. We're following along right with the truth. Next, verse 8. God continues to speak. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not... Yield my glory to another, or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. The Lord doesn't meekly say these words. I'm the Lord, that's my name, you know, come on, that's my name, that's my stuff. He commands them firmly. That he is the Lord. That God is his name. That he will not tolerate his glory or praise going to anyone else or idols. We want to say, karma's up. It's going to come back and get you. Karma is not real. God is real. God punishes people. God is the one who gives that revenge to people, not karma. Karma is an imaginary force made up by an Eastern religion. It takes credit and glory from God and gives it to something else. By saying there's an invisible force out there named karma who will pay people back, we take that credit from God. And by doing that, we can pretend and convince ourselves 
that God is not going to punish us as long as we are good enough, our good karma is going to come back to us and we're going to be all right. But the whole point of karma is to build up enough good points so you can be reincarnated to a better position in the next life. That is what that religion teaches, which is where karma comes from. But scripture says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Scripture says, leave room for God's wrath. Don't seek to repay evil for evil, but repay evil with good. He says that he is the sovereign ruler of creation and will not submit to another. So now as we move from prophecy about Jesus to the time in his life leading up to his death, we are in fact looking at the week before his arrest. That's what we commemorate today as the beginning of Holy Week, Palm Sunday. This moment before he heads to Jerusalem reveals something for us, though. Next, John chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Real quick, anybody know what the Passover is? The Passover is the Jewish celebration of the spreading of the blood of the lamb over the doorhouse, door posts, door frames, door frames, excuse me. In Egypt, when the plagues were happening to Pharaoh, the blood over the household of the Israelites spared their firstborn sons from being killed or during that plague. When the spirit of the angel of death came into Egypt and slaughtered all the firstborn children, he passed over every house that had blood over it, the blood of a lamb. Does anybody know what a lamb is? Because I didn't know up until recently that when I was eating lamb, it meant a baby sheep. It tastes so good, though. <laughs> but I had a blonde moment. <laughs> I didn't know what a lamb was. A lamb is a baby sheep. <laughs> you know what? Sometimes I forget how to write my name, so let's not give me a hard time. Who here has forgotten how to spell their name once in their life? Uh, <laughs> no, you never went to say any hands. You never, okay, I see, I see. We're, so we don't want to admit that we have a few moments where we go to sign our name and we put the wrong letters in there. <laughs> maybe it's easy for y'all, because maybe you don't have nicknames. I have a shortened version of my name, so if there's times where I try to write out Michael, and I've, I've mixed Mike in there, and it's come out like Nickel. <laughs> and I'm like, oops. Or maybe you wrote your name on the wrong line of that form. Maybe that's a little more realistic and understanding. Maybe we can admit to that and be less embarrassed. It's all right, though, because we're goofy. <laughs> that's why I ask what a lamb is, though, because some people don't understand. It's different when it's a full-grown sheep versus it being a lamb that has to die. It has to be a lamb's blood, not a full-grown adult's blood. A baby's blood. Verse 2. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Next. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. Pay attention to verse 6. It shows us something that we don't normally notice and we don't normally know about Judas. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in him. Judas used to take from the ministry supplies for himself before he sold out Jesus. Judas was already corrupt. Judas already had that pride, entitlement, and greed in his heart corrupting him. And this truth of Scripture reveals it to us. When we wonder about the Scripture that says that Satan entered Judas and compelled him to betray Jesus, he was already susceptible to it because the pride, entitlement, and greed in him was already corrupting his heart to where he was already sinning actively against God himself. He was already stealing. 
already taken for himself, something that didn't belong to him, just like Adam and Eve. Another truth revealed here, though, that I didn't see before, is the practice of giving. In order for there to be money in this money bag for Jesus' ministry to exist, somebody had to have given that money to them. We don't have a record of Jesus working. We have a record of Jesus traveling and preaching. So some people argue that tithing is unbiblical, but it isn't. There are many verses about tithings and tithing and offering. Some people can say that the word tithe is not in the Bible. It's not true. But even if it were true, there is things like this, where we see that people are giving perfume to honor God. People are giving money so that the ministry can exist. Some resist the idea of giving to the local church based on the premise, I've heard somebody say this to my face, what's Jesus going to do with my money? Well, Jesus was dedicated to the ministry while he was here. Something that he could only do because of the support of believers. And we aren't talking about this because we're trying to get John to give us money. We're talking about this because it's in the scripture right here. Just because we talk about something doesn't mean we're saying it to you to convict you or make guilt trip you or anything like that. It's because it's here for you and God to work out. Jesus also had the circumstances of traveling by foot, maybe donkey or something on occasion, but then being put up somewhere to live by his followers, who would also provide his needs. So Jesus could travel to a new place to preach, and he would find a place where somebody would give him a roof to stay under. Because he didn't have an RV. He didn't have a tent that he was pitching in order to sleep. He was counting on the people in there. There's actually other scripture where Jesus is talking to his disciples, telling them to travel from town to town and preach the good news. Whoever does not receive you, including putting you up in a place to live, shake the dust off your feet and leave that town behind. It will be better for, I think it's Sodom and Gomorrah in that scripture, that it will be for them who reject the preacher of God. But Jesus uses the money given to his body of believers, the same, oh, excuse me, Jesus uses the money given to this body of believers to answer the question of what Jesus is going to do with your money in 2024 to keep this building for us together. It keeps the electricity on, the water flowing, the furnace going and pumping out heat when it's cold, the air going when it's hot and we're sweaty. Or maybe it's just me that's sweaty all the time because that's just my constant state of being, apparently. It also provides us supplies for worship, including these palm crosses today, the paper and ink of your bulletins. It provides the snacks and the Bibles throughout the church and the kids' class. It provides everything that we need so that we can be blessed to serve in these opportunities. That's what Jesus does with money today with a good church in 2024. Unfortunately, there are Judases in certain churches. Not this one. Nobody here takes money for themselves or gets any pay for it. All the resources that are given to us in faith go to keeping this ministry alive. This body of believers is committed to that. That's why this body of believers works beyond the ministry to keep money flowing into it so that we can keep doing what God has called us to do. In the early church, I think it was Paul, I'm sure somebody will correct me if they know better, it was either Paul or one of the other P's. They worked a job to earn their money. <laughs> that probably sounded kind of bad when I said the other P's, right? <laughs> well, they were P's in a pod for a while until they got split up. Paul worked while he was on his missionary journeys. And he, he, he had a specific point of not taking things from people that was important to him. Not necessarily that that's how we have to do things, but he wouldn't take from others. He worked to pay his own way. Right. But he let all the people working with him Thank you. eat off of the donations made to them. And we love that when people have knowledge in the church body to affirm or deny something to us. They call us out when it's wrong. So definitely it was Paul. 
Paul worked in order to keep going so that the money was focused on the mission. Right? Not that it's what we have to do today, but it, we have an example in the early church of it being done. We strive with the blessings that God gives us to be like that, to focus on keeping the blessings that he gives us going to where they need to go. It's part of the reason why I left an opportunity to be staffed as a salaried pastor. Because I could see that that was an issue. I could see that it was more important for other things to be taken care of than to fulfill the Great Commission. There are many Judases in the world, the greedy thieves out for themselves. Sometimes it's in our jobs. And they create a barrier for those who would give to support work like this. They create discouragement in the workplace. Next. But Jesus speaks to the woman defending her. He speaks to the disciple. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. I know it's probably hard to see, but... It is what it is right now. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. Her perfume had an intent. It had a purpose. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Notice how Jesus sets his priorities. He is to be first. Jesus is to be first, then the needy. This means that our spiritual health and relationship with him is to be the number one priority in our lives. We must never put others above our relationship with Jesus. It doesn't mean to not take care of the needy. But it means to always keep Jesus number one. It means to never compromise that God is his name and that he gets the glory for anything. You'll find, however, that maintaining a relationship with those in the world is impossible if you are honoring God with your life. Those who love their sin and love the world will ghost you because of the light that is in you. The people in the world wanted to kill Jesus but they also wanted to kill or destroy any evidence that he wasn't his God. Next. Verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. And as it was written, as it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Next. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. Next. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Hosanna means safe. And the people shouted it in excitement for the king's arrival. The church tradition of using palms and celebrating Palm Sunday is in memory of this moment, this fulfillment of prophecy. We can celebrate, but we must remember what he entered Jerusalem to do. That's part of why we celebrate but I have to remember this joyous occasion for us is a deeply sad one for him. We have to remember that the freedom, hope, salvation, and eternal life that we look forward to is because he is about to suffer immensely. Let's look into our final passage of scripture this morning to understand a little more about what the arrival of the Messiah in Jerusalem means to us. Next, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, is not a part of his, this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. So understanding that Jesus is the high priest is important for us. 
because the high priest in the community was the one who had entered the most sacred place where everyone else wasn't allowed. The high priest went there to intercede for the people in the community through prayer and sacrifice. The high priest was the mediator between us and God. Jesus is now the, that mediator and no longer has to be the Levites. Jesus became the eternal high priest for us, sacrificing himself as the perfect lamb, praying for us during his life, and campaigning for us in heaven now. Next, verse 13. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? Next. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Next. I invite you to join us in prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice, for your fulfillment of prophecy, for your example that you set for us, for the truths that you teach us that are eternal, for the truths that you preserve for us to see today, for the new bits of wisdom, for every time that you give us enough strength to make it to that next level of connection with you, that next level of growth with you. Every time you defeat the devil for us, every time you destroy a barrier for us, thank you. Thank you for campaigning and interceding for us now in heaven that we would be acceptable to God. Campaigning for us that we would grow closer to you. Thank you for what you have done. We pray today that you would forgive us for the sins that are on our hearts today, that are on our minds today, that we commit to you in prayer right now silently, that we ask you to give us the strength to overcome, that we ask you to keep us free of those chains, to break those chains permanently, throw them into the river, and nobody will find them so we can be permanently free. We know that if we ask for these things in your name, Jesus, that you will give them to us. We ask you for healing and for protection over our earthly vessels, that we would be able to continue to live, continue to have opportunities to glorify you, that you would bring us back on Wednesday and Friday, as well as next Sunday, to continue to grow with you, to continue to receive your blessings in our lives. We ask you for all of these things in your name, Jesus. All God's people said, Amen. I invite you to stand and join us for praise.